Okay, week three, uh, word sorts. So first reading, uh, what I got out of this chapter is about using picture sorting for E&L kids. I used this with one of my students last year who was new to America from Russia. We would practice using pictures and the sheets had blanks where she could write the words too. Her reading vocabulary was significantly lower than the words she could understand by listening. <clears throat> I was also thinking about the concept sorts being a good activity for ELA class. I think we do that automatically anyway. We have students group things like setting, characterization, theme, motifs, and literary devices so they can identify commonalities. I really like the idea of having students perform their own sorts when they have learned more words, explaining why they sorted them as they did. I think in ELA class, the guess my category wouldn't be as effective as if it were used with beginner ENL students. In my experience, students really enjoy word hunts and those kinds of puzzles. Last Last year, one word hunt puzzle kept my students busy for an entire 90 minute period. The kind I used is more of a word search, whereas the one in the book is much more basic. I like word searches better because it forces students to look for the word backwards, forwards, and diagonally. I feel like the kind in the book, <clears throat> underlining the word in a story, is a simple hunt and peck method. I wouldn't use that with high schoolers. Writing sorts would be interesting for high schoolers in that we could cover SAT words or words that share prefixes and suffixes, for example. I could see the speed sort being way too stressful for many of the students who suffer from anxiety. I would never use that. Homophones is something I would cover with e &L students. I like the idea of making picture books for those. Associating a sentence with the picture, as in the diagram, is good too. They can label it with a sentence to help them remember the difference. The chapter only addresses activities up to fourth grade, so it doesn't really help me at all. I wish they discussed high, high school activities. The derivational relations seems like it would be most appropriate for high school students. In the second chapter reading, this chapter is much more up my alley. I was suffering some cognitive dissonance with all of the early childhood development information. With middle schoolers, we sometimes work on Latin roots and prefixes and suffixes. I always find those fun. What I usually notice with high schoolers is that they don't take the time to see the roots in a word that would help them to understand the spelling or definition. Many students simply want to go through a word quickly and don't want to spend an extra minute learning spelling or meaning. While I appreciate how Mr. Ramirez teaches it, <clears throat> I feel like some students won't internalize this method of thinking when they encounter new words. I would be interested to hear high schoolers talk through how they spell a word they don't know. Exactly what is their process for figuring it out? I'm sure some guess, I'm sure some try to sound it out using sounds and letters they know, and I'm sure a very low number use the strategies in the chapter. The phrase that stuck out to me the most was, now you're going to learn how spelling stands for meaning on page 251. My high school offered Lat offers Latin as a subject, but I feel like it is something that should be required for every student. Learning Latin is so helpful for many purposes, not just learning words. Finally, I truly appreciate the activity section. So often in these type of texts and books, all you get is theory and the same beliefs said over and over again with no practical application. <clears throat> Instead of saying why we should do something, show how it is applied. In the final reading, reading number three, re-envisioning spelling, uh, whole class spelling is bad. So what I got out of it, whole class spelling is bad, targeted approach, contextual liter literacy, is great. I have noticed that many students can get stuck on word recognition, pronunciation, and meaning that they are too busy for spelling. It's difficult to build spelling activities into a high school classroom day. We build in vocabulary, word definition, not spelling. We want them to remember what a word means while they are reading, so we build vocabulary recognition around whatever text we are reading at the time. I have never in all my years, witnessed a teacher who builds spelling into it when discussing vocabulary. <clears throat> my takeaway from this article <clears throat> was the three spelling instruction and assessment principles. Number one was starting point, the starting point for all spelling instruction is meaning. Number two, attention should be paid to all the threads of spelling knowledge in all grades. I would argue that that is also across all content, even though it doesn't specify that in the book. Number three, spelling, the way words work in English, should be taught explicitly. This was all found on page four. I feel like we do a decent job in the high schools, at least in my district anyway. I'm obviously not in every ELA classroom during the year for every single unit, but I know the teachers. 
I believe many of them cover numbers one and three, but few cover number two. A teacher I worked with at one of the middle schools spent a significant amount of time on number two, which was attention to be paid to all threads of spelling knowledge in all grades. <clears throat> but he's been the only one that I've witnessed. I appreciate the table to assessment, type of assessment, when to use, and how to use the data. It makes the connections more easy to understand and follow, page six. I can see actually using this in the classroom. Since this article references the text we are using, it makes sense they don't spell out what activities we should be doing and expect us to actually use our reference text instead. 